Hello, Claire. Hi, uh, I, forget, I, I forgot who I was talking to today because he said Tom. Uh, and oh. I thought, well, no, it can't be. It must be Nick because oh, I've made a stupid fool of myself. Hello there. Hello, Claire. Uh, hello. Yeah, um, I was, I've was. i been listening to a uh, few other callers uh, with great interest. And um, I just feel that if NATO were to go in, that that's a big if. Um the the UK would just be the prime target because we're not connected to the the main land mass of Russia and you know we we would be like um cannon fodder really so we would be you know like like we, yeah prime target right because uh, they, they, we are further away from Russia so they wouldn't get uh, sort of irradiated from bombing yeah. us, is that what you uh, mean? We're, yeah, we're right. just an island on our own mm. uh, whereas if they were to do it to Germany or France, or uh, you know, they're all connected and, uh, you know as we know with Chernobyl, the effect it had yeah. uh, with the radiation spreading across through, you know, through the atmosphere um I've, I've heard, yeah, I, I, I've heard a lot of people talking about the uh, Third World War, and we're all going to get blown up. And uh, I don't know. I mean, but you know, if if we'd had this conversation a month ago, would we be uh, would we have imagined that we'd be talking about war in Europe? Probably not. But it just seems inconceivable that we're going to have a nuclear war. I mean, maybe people need to just step back from that a bit. I mean, he he might be. Um, he might be a megalomaniac, but he's not completely insane. If we do go nuke, then he's going to die, and his children are going to die, and his wife's going to die, and his houses are going to get blown up, and he's going to be king of an irradiated smoking mess. So, I just, well, I just can't see it. Of an irradiated smoking mess. He'll, um, be, he'll be what? But I was just saying, if if uh, the first, you know, if we was to make the attack. Uh, it, it, it's got a, you know, it's, it's a play, it's a game of chance, isn't it? And I just feel that the UK would be the first target. Mm, well, I think um, I, th I think we should. It's probably a good idea to stop talking about that. I mean, <laughs> I, I kind of get an. It's not annoyed. It's just exasperated. That's probably the the feeling. People are. They, we seem to be actively engaged in winding ourselves up into uh, a, set, a state of panic about this. What kind of a person would start a, a worldwide nuclear war? I mean, it would, be, uh, it, it would be somebody who's trying to commit suicide on the grandest scale that could possibly be imagined. No one's going to survive it. M maybe we should just stop trying to wind ourselves up in uh, in that regard and um, deal with something that's awful but not that bad I think people sort of get th there is a certain sense of getting addicted to fear addicted to panic addicted to that um, chemical release that goes off in your brain when you get angry or fearful and and I think people sort of sense that and they oh, yeah there it is and I'm gonna work on that for a while it's uh, it, it's kind of like a drug addiction, uh, really. Um, maybe if we just weaned ourselves off it, it might be a good idea. Because essentially, we can freak ourselves out. You know, I was listening to um, Tom this afternoon. Um, he had a call from a, a bloke who said, uh, I've got an eight-year-old daughter, and she asked me, um, what, what's going to happen, Daddy, if, the, uh, if we get a nuclear war? And he was saying, well, what we're going to do is we're, we're going to get a lot of tins and we're going to go down in the basement and, you know, we're probably, I can't remember exactly what he said, but it's, uh, you know, everything will be uh, 
uh, like a smoking ruin, and, and I thought, oh, for God's sake, she's eight years old. Just tell her a fairy story, kiss her on the forehead, and tuck her in for the night. Let's stop freaking out. It won't make any difference one way or the other. Dial it down just a bit. Unless I'm getting it wrong, in which case you must correct me. Tom says, uh, the caller Claire forgets uh, we have Trident. If Putin were to strike a Vanguard-class submarine, which is currently out on patrol, we'd be sending up 40 missiles right back. See, there you go. It's exactly right. That's exactly what I'm saying. Can we just dial it back a bit? Stressum. Hello, Lenny. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. Okay. This was just uh, about a, about a, two months ago, actually, after the London Bridge incident, where that kid beat off the terrorist with his skateboard. I decided I'm not having that, so I bought myself a blade. Carried it in my hip pocket. Okay. So one night, you know how it gets dark so early here. I was just out for a couple of beers to the corner shop. Now, I ran into a gang of punks, 15, 16 years old. They were harassing people coming in out of the in and out of the corner shop. I said, I'm not having that. So I did follow the police procedure because I was a junior cop back in Chicago. First thing you do is you issue a warning. I say, okay, you little punks. I got a blade on me. I'm going to slash up your pretty little faces. And they all run off. <laughs> and what did they do? They ran to a cop. They found a cop. And the cop came after the easy target. What about this gang of punks? No, they didn't collect them. They collected me, and they brought me to the station. And I went before the judge, and he says, well, you know, I'll put him in jail. So I was in jail for two nights. Okay? The way I figure, I got free room and board. <laughs> anyway, so he gave me a lenient sentence, 90 pounds, I believe, which paid for my room and board, and a curfew. Be home by 7 o'clock. I'm home by 7 o'clock most times anyway. Anyway. And so I, I, th I think I got under the circumstances fair treatment. But again, I did not produce a weapon. I did not attack anybody w with a weapon. And that's why I think I believe in this case I got fair treatment. So right. So you didn't actually take your weapon out. You just threatened them with the potential of it. Yes. Hmm. And uh, right. Uh, and you seem to be okay with that, with the with the treatment that you received. Well, you know, it, it, I, I understand the judge's, uh, judge's um, judgment, right. and, 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 and I think that um, I'll go along with it, knowing my uh, history of... No, my father was a cop, my uncle was a cop, I was a cop. I understand the, the judge's um, judgment. And how would it okay, have gone so down, how would the same situation have gone down in America? How, how would your treatment have differed? Well... Back in the States, it, it, it can depend. In Chicago, the police department, you know, they size you up pretty quickly, okay? And they'll take you in if they recognize you're a severe problem, okay? Now, I've never carried a weapon, well, not that I admit, but I've never carried a weapon in Chicago. Um, and, uh, and so I was never guilty of, of uh, a misdemeanor. Right. It very much depends on which state you're in in America, doesn't it? I mean, if, if you're in Florida... Chicago. If, yeah, if you're in Florida, you can just blast away at uh, somebody who cuts you up on um, on I-95. Well, yeah, it depends on the state. States have their own laws. Yeah. In Chicago, it's the law of the street. Right. <laughs> OK. And uh, apparently so in Streatham. Thanks for that, Lenny. Uh, South Shields. Hello, Noel. Hello there. No. You all right? Yes, good, thanks. It's, uh, you, you know what, what, what is it, guys? I don't want to throw to matter with people. I know. Well, first of all, I'm 52. I don't play Call of Duty. Okay? But uh, I'd be extremely proud to go over there and pick up a rifle and go off. How much training do you need to point a gun and to pull a trigger? Do you know what I mean? Uh, and people are going, going on about, like, oh, well, this and oh, well, that. Yeah, I, I think this trust is getting a rough deal on what you said. And, you, you know, I mean, this guy's a tyrant, he's a terrorist. Right, but I'm, I'm not sure uh, a bunch of uh, clueless amateurs uh, wandering around the street in search of a target is actually going to help in any way. You're just, um, you're just, you'll be uh, just getting in the way.
rather than actually uh, affecting any positive outcome. That's what it seems to me. Plus, there is the uh, small matter of it being completely illegal. Honington. Honington, rather. Dave. Hi, Nick. Dave. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, yeah, I don't want to be into this. Uh, he's started a war he can't, he cannot possibly win. But at the end of the day, the, the, the things we do, um, like sanctions, uh, fantastic. Get them done. Nothing in, nothing out. Don't export anything, don't import anything, don't let it run through the channel. All of that, but there's one thing that, that, um, could take a step back, think outside the box, and imagine, um, a worldwide or European wide pop concert. <laughs> Free the Ukraine. A pop okay, concert. could you imagine that? It was, no, I'm not being funny. They had it for live aid, mm. didn't they? Could you imagine that in his face all over the world? Free the Ukraine. Well, sorry, it's it's just I think trying to think outside the box. Let me down lightly, Nick, please. If I'm wrong, <laughs> but well, but I, su I suppose it couldn't it couldn't hurt. I'm not sure it would help, well, well, but it couldn't hurt. See. So why not? Well, well, I don't I don't see. Uh, it would be in his face right. all over the world. Mm. And it's a, a form of um, keep the sanctions up, but you can't military uh, intervene. Can We can't, can we, uh, at the end of the day? Well, we could, it's impossible. But, but people are, um, uh, are, are you know, raising the prospect that uh, it's going to be the end of the world if we do. Um, I don't buy it. Um, if if I am proved wrong, then um, I won't uh, lose face because there won't be anybody left to say I told you so. But I just don't buy it. But thanks, Dave. Ealing. Hello, Stanley. Oh, hi there, Nick. How are you? Good, thanks. So, look, just very, very quickly for context. Uh, I'm, I'm a British citizen for many, many years, uh, albeit through nationalisation. Um, I love my country dearly, um, so I'm not anti-establishment in the slightest whatsoever. I was listening to LBC a few hours ago, around about 8 o'clock, and uh, sorry, I forget who was presenting, but just listening to that programme, I was, I was shocked by what I was hearing in terms of the level of hypocrisy vis-a-vis -vis 20 years ago when the US uh, decided to invade Iraq, another sovereign nation, um, with its own independence, um, without a UN mandate, and yet none of our politicians were talking about sanctions, um, etc. Um, it seemed to be a completely different dialogue when the shoes on the other foot. I would, and I would agree with that. But allies yeah, I, decide I, I would agree to make with a that. decision in their own interest. Yes, versus... Stanley. Stanley, I would, I would agree with that. But um, are you saying that that was wrong? I'm saying that the it it makes it very difficult for us to have any credibility um, okay. as a nation or as a set of nations. Yeah, I, I, I understand. I understand that, but but I think the issue is: was that wrong? And if so, then this is wrong too. And because of uh, because we did the wrong thing then, doesn't mean to say that we should do the wrong thing now. Yeah, but I don't think that's the basis for the decision. I, I don't think anyone in in our government is saying, "Yeah, we made a bad decision twenty years ago, and we should prevent that from happening now." I think it's purely about. It's in our interest to back Ukraine right now, and 20 years ago, it was in our interest to back America. Mm. I don't think there's anything genuine about what anyone's saying. And just casting back to your previous call from Belfast, who sounds like, although he didn't say it, but has clearly lived in uh, through through the, the difficult times there at, at the hands of the you know um, the, the situation. I don't think enough's being done to actually listen to the people out there who are ultimately going to suffer from this situation. I think this is really just a question, again, of politicians and historically imperial nations making decisions about what should happen in the world with a complete disregard to what actually is going to occur on the ground to the people there. Just as happened in Iraq, unfortunately, where... Hundreds of thousands of people, if not, you know, a million plus, 
innocently died for no reason. Well, that, but, seems yeah, to be, yeah, that seems to be completely lost in right. the conversation. Well, I understand that, but that, that, that's something of a what about, though, isn't it? I mean, if, we, if we're dealing with the situation now, surely we, be, we should be concentrating on this rather than any missteps and, for, and uh, 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 you know, lies and uh, catastrophic decisions that may have happened in the past. Agreed, but I still think that, you know, there's been an opportunity here for, for considerable dialogue. It sounds to me like... like and obviously, I don't know the individual personally, but Putin's biggest concern is Ukraine, which is on its doorstep, joining NATO. Uh, let me give you a hypothetical. Let's just say that, you know, next year, the, the province of Quebec were to, to vote for independence from Canada, right? Um, they've tried it in the past. They haven't been very far off. Let's say they were to succeed in that. And then all of a sudden, they feel threatened by, you know, the nation they've just left and decide to enter into a um, military alliance with Russia. Do you think America would just sit there silently by and let that happen? Um, we saw what happened with the Cuban Missile Crisis not too long ago, right? Um, well, that, that was a very long time ago. It's not in the context of the world. Fifty years is nothing, right? We were at the brink of nuclear war. But, but Stanley, you, and, seem, you seem to be going back in, in history to try to justify um, letting uh, a dictator take over a sovereign country if we have done awful things in the past but that doesn't excuse anybody from doing awful things in the present or the future it's just this what about uh, and i understand what you're saying but it, it also seems a bit weird that if uh, vladimir putin's goal is to distance himself from nato that by taking over ukraine he would have a NATO, he would have nato countries on his border at least as it is at the moment, Ukraine is a buffer between them and, or between us and him. So if that is actually his, uh, his uh, stated aim, then it doesn't make any logical sense, because he's bringing himself nearer to NATO, not further away. Uh, but I appreciate that, Stanley. Thank you. Luton. Hello, John. Yeah, hi there. Yeah, I guess one point that um, a friend of mine who spent time in Russia... He says the people are missing the fact that Putin is really just um, uh, the mouthpiece, and that and the very, there is a whole network of ex KGB and uh, leaders who are planning to get the Soviet Union reinstated, and I think that that's one of the dangers of just seeing it as one person. It's not one person; it's more serious than that. That's just one point I'd make, and. Um, the other point, which I know <clears throat> you might not like, but <clears throat> there is some truth in it. As bad as um, the current president of the United States is, is deemed very weak. I think he is very weak. And um, I do think, although Trump was awful and, and very confused in many ways, the very fact that he was so uncertain and unpredictable, when faced with a dictator, the dictators were almost cancelling each other out. So I do, ironically, I don't. That's why it didn't happen under, under Trump's leadership. He wouldn't have dared to attack attack if Trump was leader. I completely disagree. Donald Trump has done nothing but support Vladimir Putin in everything that he has said and done. He seems to be on Vladimir Putin's side. He agreed with Vladimir Putin that Ukraine is not a country. He agreed with Vladimir Putin that it should be part of Russia. Absolutely nothing that Donald Trump has ever said or done would have given Vladimir Putin pause for thought. What, what, what is this, uh, this impression that some people have that Donald Trump would have uh, pr presented some sort of uh, wall that Vladimir Putin would not have been, been able to get around? I don't get it. It seems to me that every single thing that Donald Trump has ever said and done is that he's in Vladimir Putin's pocket. Camden. Hello, Mike. Good afternoon, sir. I'll say afternoon. It feels like afternoon. I'm a night man, sir. Oh, My yes. clock's all back to front. How okay. are you? Very well, thanks. I think we've been very generous over the years and decades, to be honest with you. I don't, I don't think we're stingy when it comes to looking after people. If uh, you know, go back into the seven. Remember the army and kicked a lot of people out of his country. They're on all the planes were full of them all over. He looked after them. We've always been good. I, I, I won't buy that. Okay. To be honest with you. So, uh, what did you make of um, what Pretty Patel said then? Hundred thousand. As I mean, I don't that does, that to Pretty Patel. Right. Okay. Pretty Patel is useless. Like the rest of the clowns that Boris has in government. You want a clown? We're going to get. 
you're going to get them in, please. The whole lot of them are shoddy. I, I can't listen to her. She's useless. Yeah, but what, She's got some backbone, some right, real you, people you, in power. You don't have to listen to her. I'm just asking you about what she said. 100,000. Does that sound right? Too many? Go on. She's off her head. Um, look, 100,000. Look, the war's four days old, and we're already having arguments about this. This is, like, really annoying. Um, first of all, most of them are going to go through the borders right next door right now because they need to get out. And we're all discussing about, oh, how many we're going to let in. Jesus Christ. You know, making a drama out of a crisis. Jesus. Uh, OK. I'm not really sure what your, what your point is there, Mike, but um, uh, I wish you a good afternoon. Chingford, hello, Tony. Hello, oh, Nick. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Yeah, I'm... Uh, what was I going to say? Yeah, I said the... I was wondering if we really bothered that much about Ukraine, because uh, you, you think knowing... Putin's personality that, that he's going to take it as far as he possibly can and you know a few um, sanctions here and there is, isn't going to do anything to him it's not even going to hit his radar I think to me if I was that kind of bully that kind of I don't know what you call him narcissist um, I would react to a sudden kick in the teeth quite frankly um, what, would that, what like, would that look like? Um, well bring the curtain back down Bring just, the, what, what do you mean? Well, the iron curtain, to bring it right down, just say, you pack it in now, or that's it, you're on your own. No trade, no football, you know, no <laughs> sport, no this, no that, no right. whatever. You'll be back to where you were in 90, that's what you want. If, this is, if you want the Cold War so much that you miss so much, then you can have it back. Hmm. You can have it back if you don't get the hell out. I suppose the, uh, the, the sort of... Uh, steps that you're talking about would hurt uh, Vladimir Putin perhaps a bit, maybe not personally, because I'm sure that he's uh, got plenty enough money to keep him going in the manner to which he has become accustomed. It would affect the Russian people significantly. Uh, they may, you know, in time, if they're, if they're allowed, um, you know, rise up against him. But what it would certainly do is affect us in the West, because any economic measures that we uh, impose on Russia are going to come back on us quite significantly. And the difference between Russia and here is that politicians in this country depend on the uh, the support of the public. Vladimir Putin doesn't need the support of the public in Russia to maintain his grip on power. I guess I guess that's the big difference, which is probably which probably informs why our politicians and those in America and uh, you know the rest of Europe are a bit loath to do something that's going to really impact on the uh, voting public. Uh, thanks for that, Tony Guilford. Hello, Alistair. Hello. Good evening, Alistair. Uh, yes, um, I'm. Very surprised that a lot of general public are feeling that Boris is not doing enough. Um, it's sad to see that everyone's saying that Great Britain are not stepping up, but they are. We're doing as much as we possibly can. Um, if we go any further and start putting troops on the ground, I think we'll find that Putin may do something silly. Um, and I feel that like, the general public need to know that if we go that far, he could be easily pressing buttons. So... We are doing as much diplomatic stuff as we can. What we do need to do is send more military uh, weaponry, anti-tank weapons and anti-aircraft stuff, if we possibly can, without causing any more problems for ourselves. But um, I just wish that the general public would appreciate that uh, Boris is doing as much as he possibly can behind the scenes, um, and he's doing an incredible job. Well, uh, that is one view. I mean, you could also say that he waited a very long time before uh, placing sanctions on various oligarchs, plenty of time for them to move their assets to where the British government and the authorities couldn't get at them. And there's also some yeah. big, big names that are still off the list, and they've still refused to give back the two million or so pounds that they've received from Russians over the last few years. So not quite everything that he could possibly do. No, there's always going to be the criticisms of what he can and what he can't do. But, uh, I, you know, I, you know I, I know he's not the most popular pr uh, prime minister we've got, but I support him initially and I'm, I, would, I would 
an activist in the Conservative Party. And I was disheartened slightly what's been going on and what he's been acting to doing. But, yes, we we can always say that he could have done more. But, you know, it's it's very frightening when someone's threatening you with nuclear war and pre- want to press a button. Um, you've got to tread very carefully. Um, it's, it's frightening. I'll be honest. We're frightened. Um, my family's frightened of what's going on. I've got friends in Ukraine. Um, and they're hunking down in the basement. So it's, it's you know, it is a frightening time, but um, it, it's it's hard. It is hard, and it's quite emotional to see it all happening. We thought we are going to be a peaceful world, but it's all gone tits up, hasn't it, really, unfortunately? Uh, well, that's a blunt way of putting it. Yes, thanks, Alistair. Uh, Seven Kings, Hyder. Hello. Yes, sir. How are you doing, Nick? Good, thanks. Right. Got a bit of a slab, well, different opinion as the rest of the world for some reason. Um, everyone's naming Putin as the bad person, but no one's actually looking at what the Prime Minister of Ukraine is actually doing at the moment. And um, I think that's a bit more serious, to be honest. I mean, he's a, he's armed all the civilians with um, AK-47. Um, that's to say that they even know how to use one. That's number one. Um, number two, they act as though they have no criminals in their country and no one that does anything wrong. So if you go and arm the whole country, well, especially the older men, age between 18 and 60, with all the weapons, what makes them think that they would not use it for bad things or for, for things that are not meant to be used for? Not only a firearm is not meant to be used by just anyone. You've got professional army, which is Russia. And if they see a normal civilian dressed in normal clothes with an AK-47, they're going to shoot him. The, the, the civilian won't stand a chance. You will get shot straight away by the, by, by the Russian army. And then what? You'll get a nice little picture to show that the Russian army has killed a citizen with an AK-47. Without realising who gave him the AK-47 in the first place without knowing how to use it. Well, I don't that, know I me, don't know anything about weapons, but um, my understanding about AK-47s... Well, thank is, you very much. Is, it's, it's quite complex. Is, well, it's not well, easy... No, I think it's actually the reverse of that. My understanding of an AK-47 is it's a very simple uh, and reliable weapon. You just point and shoot. Have you, have you held one? As I said, I don't know anything about weaponry, ah, but my understanding okay. of an AK-47 is it's a very simple weapon, it's just a point and shoot. If it was a, such a simple weapon, it wouldn't be so dangerous. That doesn't make... That doesn't make any sense. It, it's the AK-47, if you go and research that, the AK-47 is not such a simple weapon as you, as you say it is. It, it has the power to destroy so much and yourself, yeah, I, I and understand. I, yourself, I'm talking about it's simple to operate. It itself and fire it, loading it and firing it itself with perfection, without any fault, is a perfection. Hyder, can, can, we, um, can we agree that neither you nor I know what we're talking about when it comes to firing an AK-47? Fine, in terms of that, but in terms of what the president, I mean, the, well, the Ukraine Prime Minister is doing with his army, um, and saying that really that the Russians are not winning and they're they have losing or putting it, that it's ridiculous. They've got the same firepower as the whole of the US, France and UK put together. That's complete. That, wanted, that's, where did you get that information? Russia has the same the, firepower look, look, as the US and uh, what were the other countries oh, look, you mentioned? Look, look, look at the warheads, how many warheads they Oh, have. you're talking about nuclear weapons. It doesn't really matter how many nuclear weapons you have. If you have a thousand or if you have 10,000, you don't need many to, um, to create a situation in which nothing on Earth lives anymore. It's not really a, a, a question of if you have more than the next country, then you win. Everybody loses. And as for the prospect of arming the citizenry, well, what else? What? I'll, I mean, I was going to dump you, but I'll just ask you one, one last question. What else would you recommend he, the president of Ukraine do? Well, for one, you wouldn't arm your citizens. Second, you no, would actually... I'm, no, no, you, you've said all that, but what should he do? Come to reason. You would come to reason at the fact that they do not want to destroy Ukraine. They just want it to, to just to protect their safety, which is not to be attacked by NATO forces. That's all that Mr. Putin wants. Right, OK, what? so, OK. All right. He just wants safety. I understand. Thanks, Haider. Uh, gold is green. Hello, John. Hello, Nick. Um, yeah, there's lots of armchair generals here. We're all armchair generals, I guess. But what prompted me to call was uh, the chap who, about 10 minutes ago, and you, you were agreeing with him, I think, that it, he, 
he wouldn't use any nuclear weapons because he wouldn't have anywhere to enjoy his money. And I, I'm just wondering whether it, 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 people have commented on his um, puffy appearance. Mm. And then when you add the fact that he wants to sit about three miles away from anybody, it, it, it's just possible that uh, the, the, the rationale for his sudden change of behavior uh, and his loss of rationality is as simple as the fact that maybe his doctors have told him he's got six months to live and he's thinking, well, you know, to hell with it. I'm just going to go for broke now um, because I want to try and establish my legacy before I go. Right. Possible. Well, I, I guess so. I mean, he doesn't look particularly well. He doesn't look well. And, and when you add the fact that, you know, he could be immunosuppressed um, so, you know, nobody can get near him, um, apart from Tinoshenko and Imran Khan. Mm. Um, but, um, yeah, you know, and I've heard, I've, I think I've read that in, in order to get a meeting where even in the same room, you've got to sort of self-isolate for a week or something ridiculous. Uh, and, it, you know, he's 69. It's possible he's just got, he, he just doesn't have long to live and he, he, he's in a hurry to establish whatever legacy he wants and therefore that makes him obviously very, very dangerous mm. because his, uh, his desire for self-preservation, which everyone's talked about, is, is now suddenly far less important. Yes. You know, one thing I haven't heard is what the process of firing a nuclear weapon actually is in Russia. I, I'm well, not even sure about what, what the process is. That. Okay, uh, go you, ahead. I mean, I know a little bit about that. They, the, the, how, just before you say anything, the, how how do you know a little bit about it? Well, only from what I only from what I've read. Okay, um, I'm sure you could have read it as well. I'm not going to give you any official secrets, but from what I understand, that you know the weapons are in place A, and the detonating systems are in place B. So so stage one is moving the weapons uh, to the vicinity of the detonating systems so that they can actually be detonated. Hmm. I, was thinking, then, I was thinking more what is the process of like, human intervention, because... There, I'm, to be I, three. There, are three, there are three keys. There are three people that have to give the OK. Um, right. I, well, see, I don't know about that, but um, uh, I, I know as much about it as you probably, John, but I can't imagine it just takes three people to launch the uh, an attack which would mean the end of the world. You have to assume that there would be a chain of command, that Putin would uh, bash his uh, weirdly small hand on a button on his desk and some uh, general with fruit salad on his chest would come in and he would take the order and then he would have to go and give it to somebody else, uh, the order, and then the order would have to go to somebody else. And at some point you'd think that one of these people would have the idea that maybe this isn't the best plan and they're not going to comply. It, it, there must be some kind of method by which the, the, the potential insanity of a leader is um, mitigated against, you'd think. Fingers crossed, eh? Uh, Stamford Hill. Hello, Joseph. Hi, hi, Nick. Joseph. Good, 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 good. You know what? It is actually confusing to hear Liz, uh, Liz Trust saying that he's supporting people or people who would like to go to Ukraine and fight for democracy. Whereas in the last couple of years, uh, they've been putting people in prison who went to fight in Iraq and uh, Syria. Then there is a case of uh, Shamima Begum, stripped of her. Her, her, her passport. Do you think this is double standards, or should we say this is hypocrisy? Well, the the, the, the two are different in that the people were going over to um, Syria and so on in order to fight on the opposite side. So that's the difference, surely. So which, which opposite side is this then? Because you know, it is a, it's according. I think to many people, it will actually seem that that. A British national is still going out there to fight in a country that is not his or has. Yes, but if we have taken up against ISIS or vice versa, if they if they are on the opposite side to us, then um, it's uh, it, it's not similar at all. I mean, we have chosen our side in uh, the Ukraine Russia battle. So, so basically, the Britain is going to fight Russia, right? Well, I don't see that the two are necessarily the same. No, if people from Britain... 
<laughs> people from Britain really? may go to, to Russia to fight Russia, but that doesn't mean to say that we as a whole have declared war on Russia. No, okay, well, okay, let me, let, let, me, let me explain how I say it. See, when Britain chooses or the West chooses to side with one, with one side or to help one side, mm. it is verified, it is right, whatever they do. But if they are, they are in conflict with one side, like Syria, Iraq, and stuff like that, then it is wrong to go and fight. So this is where, maybe you will excuse me, because since really I'm not, uh, I wasn't born here, and um, probably maybe the language could be confusing, or the culture is different. But to me, I see it as if it is just really, no, I, I would call it hypocrisy, maybe. Well, I, I don't understand what you're confused about. <laughs> Each battle, we pick sides. I mean, unless we're neutral. And in all of the uh, the uh, battles that you've just been talking about, the, the wars, the uh, conflagrations that we've just been talking about, that we have not been neutral. So people have gone a abroad to fight against our interests, and that's one thing. But if people go abroad to fight alongside those that we have... Uh, shown our support to that's completely different i don't really understand the confusion but thanks joseph q nick uh morning nick hello hello yes um uh, those make several points really one is it's it's uh, uh, almost gobsmacking how biden has allowed putin to take ukraine the way he has um as soon as the tanks were uh piling up at the border um they should have been putting in sanctions then um to crash the ruble and crash the russian stock market and not after. It seems very hindsight that uh, the EU, Biden and Boris Johnson have reacted like this. Secondly, the second point I'd like to make is that a good point was made by the uh, by Donald Trump. I know it's not, I wouldn't call him a great man, but I'd say he's quite, quite right in what he said that he would never have allowed it to get to this point where we are allowing Russian tanks to roll into Ukraine in the first place. What makes you think that? Because but Donald Trump is on record as saying that he doesn't think that Ukraine is a country. He would, so, have, been, he would have been siding, and is siding, with uh, Vladimir yeah. Putin. But on the same token, on the same token, though, that um, he was quite good at brinkmanship and, in Biden, he knows how, and Putin was fully aware of how weak Biden was when Biden evacuated Afghanistan. And um, but what Trump was good at was that he was able to to, I think he was able to do fantastic brinkmanship in in regards to North Korea. If you look at his record with North Korea, China. What, what about was, his record with North Korea impresses you? What did he um, achieve? That he shook hands on the border. He was, I think, I believe he was the first president to walk uh, to cross the border since the Korean War. But what does that achieve? In a, I think it achieves a, an idea that actually we are, the, the, the lines are open for conversation. Whereas with Biden, I don't think the lines have been there. I think it was Biden who cancelled the meeting prior to the invasion of, of Ukraine. Having a conversation with Kim Jong-un didn't actually achieve a single thing. But I think it's that fear, it's sort of like that, that, that sort of like, lev uh, sort of like levelling yeah, up. OK, what, what you're describing is that people didn't know what Donald Trump was going to do next, probably because Donald Trump didn't know what Donald Trump was going to do next. He just, he just <laughs> yeah, thought agree, it up yeah, and did it on I, the spot. That's not really something to, um, to praise. And uh, the notion that uh, Vladimir Putin would not have uh, had the nerve to take Ukraine if Donald Trump was in power is completely the opposite of the truth because as i said donald trump uh, is an admirer of vladimir putin and has in the past approved of the takeover of ukraine by russia and is um, sitting in admiration of vladimir putin's actions today so it would have happened uh, quicker and the sanctions probably would not have been uh, leveled at all but i do agree with you that they they came a bit late crawley hello martin how you doing? You're right. Yes, good. Thanks. Good, you're good. Um, yeah. So I'm not a massive political person or anything like that. But the main thing for me is that I don't think we should take any uh, of the Ukrainian refugees, let alone a hundred thousand of them. Like since the pandemic, like our our, our economic stance has crippled as it is anyway. I mean, I think the government has got to find something. It's like stupid, like four or five billion quid. 
uh, to cover the cost of the furlough schemes and stuff like that. We can't take them. We've already taken so many refugees from any other conflict that's happening, that's been happening over the last 15, 20 years, and we haven't got the face of them. Um, there was an idea the other day about local councils um, basically putting in an offer to say, oh, yeah, we can take so many. Um, but with that part is, uh, as soon as they come into the country, as it is anyway, it's like free roaming. So they will go to all the Ukrainian-speaking uh, communities, uh, family, friends, uh, to the top and side of the country. I think they need to focus on what's happening here. Um, and even if they do let in 100,000, that doesn't necessarily mean that 100, 200, 300, even a million more will travel all the way through Europe and you will still have uh, the crossing crisis is happening uh, around like the Kent coast um, with all the migrants coming in on uh, like inflatable boats and, and stuff. We, we just can't do it. We haven't got the money for it. Um, we haven't got the stance for it. Half the country is still trying to recover from the pandemic. Um, I get what's happening in Ukraine is terrible and it is awful. Um, and it's being done by an angry little man hovering over a red button because he's been sat in a, in a deep dark room for the last two years, uh, dreaming of a Soviet past. And he, to me, it kind of seems he kind of wants to bring that back. But at the moment, they're, they're putting up a good fight. They're making a stance. And I think they should keep doing what they're doing. Um, and if militarily wise, uh, we have to go in. Uh, personally, I don't think we should. But if that's the last resort, uh, and then it's all this has been boiled up for World War Three, and I think it's inevitable it's going to happen. It's either going to be Russia, or it's either going to be Korea, or we're just going to end up in a Cold War state like it was 30, 40 years ago, and spend the next 20 years wondering who's going to shoot the first missile. <laughs> Right. Well, that's a um, pretty dystopian uh, vision that you just uh, outlined for us. World War Three is uh, inevitable. You know, just from what you were saying earlier on, though, I mean, the whole world, some people might say that the whole world has just had to go through COVID. It, it's not just us. Why should people in uh, Poland, for instance, uh, take so many refugees just be just by dint of the geography, just because it's over the border and, and we take none? They shouldn't. They should, again, make their own decisions. If they don't want to take the refugees, then they shouldn't have taken them. If they feel that they haven't got the need for them, or if they, if they haven't got the um, the infrastructure to take that many refugees in, then they shouldn't. That's, that's, down, that's down on them. That's, that's a whole different debate. I mean, we took in something... I, I mean, I, I don't know the exact figure of refugees from Afghanistan. Um, when we left and obviously uh, by Al Qaeda or ISIS or wherever it was, they, they fight back up again and reset the country. Uh, we took all those refugees in. We've taken refugees in from Pakistan. We've taken refugees in from Somalia, from Ethiopia. Um, and they're still taking refugees in. We can't keep taking refugees in from every country or every state that's in a conflict with someone. Someone's in a conflict with someone somewhere. Um, but just because that's happening doesn't mean that Everyone should pipe up and be like, oh, yeah, we'll take half a million people. It's not going to happen. Countries are crippled by that. And that's what will end up happening to the likes of the UK if we take in the first hundred thousand and then that goes up and then it's half a million and then it's a million. Um, same will happen to Poland. Same will happen to Romania. Same will happen to Bulgaria. You know what I mean? Like it's Germany, France, their economies are crippled. Yes, but... If they feel that they can take them in, then let them. But I don't think we can. There's just not room for them. I think there's still refugees looking for accommodation now. When they're sat in hotels that have been closed since the beginning of the pandemic, yet they've been turned into refugee camps. And those businesses are now never going to reopen properly because of what, what's happening. So I, I don't... It's down on them. Well, you know, there's uh, there's some people reacting to what you're saying, Martin. Um, I've got one tweet from a chat called Tony who says that you're a selfish, hard-hearted, shameful person. I don't think I am. I think it's just a matter of opinion. It is an awful thing that's happening. It really is, and I don't, I I, I don't agree with what's happening at all. I just think that we need to look after our own before we start taking any more in. We we need to look after the refugees that are in the country now. Um, 
You need to sort them out first before we take any more uh, any any more. Uh, I mean, I think the government is building uh, loads of uh, like flats along like the local authority and uh, loads of other like social housing and stuff like that. Um, but if we overload, then it's just going to spill over. Right. Okay. Um, forcefully put. Thanks, Martin. Uh, Vienna, Declan. Hi, Nick. Thanks Declan. for taking my call. Actually, I wasn't going to call, but I had to, after hearing that guy, Martin, um, <laughs> one thing I couldn't get over is we can't take any more. We can't take this. Who, who, who's this we? Who's, who is Martin? You know? And this, we don't have enough space for 100,000 refugees. How many people were in Wembley yesterday at the cup final? I don't know what the... Uh, uh, is getting 90, on. 90. 90. 90,000. Right, okay. You know what I mean? So that's the capacity of Wembley Stadium. When, uh, when the first refugee crisis happened, yeah, I took... Uh, when Budapest, when Hungary closed their borders and Germany closed their borders, there were still 150,000 refugees in transit, yeah? So uh, a country of 9 million took in... 150,000 refugees, you know, which we continue to do. I personally took in two kids from the train station, two twins, you know. I'd like to ask Martin how many kids he's taken in. And if he's ever accepted unemployment benefit in this year, you know what I mean? Just like you said, Nick, I mean, I'm not going to get into race and religion and anything, but if you're born in, America, in England... You are the luckiest person in the world. And coming from me, from Belfast, <laughs> being born, I, I was probably one of the unluckiest ones. So, Martin, wind your neck in. You xenophobe. Really. You know, he's talking about our money, our money. What does he... You know, I am uh, uh, what, what pretty mother Pretty Patel says is an economic migrant to Austria. I have four businesses here. I employ 21 people. 21 people. That's uh, uh, for the for the treasury. I'm keeping them sweet. You know what? And and you, you can come over and pick fruit. You whoa, 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 whoa. Can, <laughs> yeah. I, I just like I just like England to step back for a minute, yeah, and look at the rest of Europe and look at how we're looking. No oh. man. Yeah, okay. All right. He just, uh, he got a little bit over emotional and uh, expressed himself in builder's terms. But um, I get what you're saying. Thanks for that. Norwich. Hello, Joe. Oh, good evening. Good evening. I, I, I'd like to say, Ben Wallace, um, really, I, I, he wants to look at the record with his government and what they've done to the armed forces. And now the army numbers are the lowest they've been since the Battle of Waterloo when I go to history. Well, um, like, like with um, with many of uh, the uh, other methods of keeping us safe, like the police and the legal system, which we'll talk about later on in uh, this programme, under the Conservative government, it has been uh, defunded. Since 2012, it's the armed forces have been consistently... Uh, they've consistently had a deficit of personnel which has only got worse uh, with each passing year. Well, well, even if they're at full strength, it'd be 82,000. Um, Russia have 900,000 troops. Uh, yeah, something of that so, order. So, I, I, if anybody's kicking butts, it's only going one way. I, I was in, in the, the Coldstream Guards, um, and I look back, um, 30 years ago, this time, this 30 years ago, about this time of year, I was training to drive a warrior. The new it was at the time their new armoured personnel carrier. Hmm. They've still got them. Right. It's, it's equivalent of a Sierra. <laughs> if you're looking in car times, do you know what I mean? Right. Well, just as long as it's got, uh, just as long as it's not a Hillman imp. Yeah, well, you're getting close to it. The, 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 it's hey, it, it was good at the time, but it's thirty years old. It's like a classic vehicle now. Hmm. Okay, uh, that's um, somewhat alarming, but thanks for that, Joe. Uh, Tinmouth. Hello, David. Yes, good evening. Yeah, I'm just re reiterating the, the last chap. 
it's the most obvious thing that has been on the television, all these interviews and the reporters, is the fact that the huge majority of the people that are coming out of the uh, of, of your, the Ukraine are women and children. The men have been turned back and told you're going to go and fight. So I think if you could bring tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands in, and families in this country would take on a, a mother and a couple of small children, and you could distribute them quite easily because there is a, quite a large Ukrainian population in this country. Anyway, but how can you... How can, and I'm a Tory... I, I disagree with you on everything else, but <laughs> it is a disgr- absolute disgrace to to the, what Priti Patel, and I think she's come from an immigrant family as well, so I don't know what she's talking about. But it's the whole thing is the perfect situation to provide what what every decent society would do. They look after the women and children and the men do the fighting and all we're doing and most of them would go back when they when they've sorted it all out but there is no excuse they shouldn't even have to fill in a form they just come in and they're distributed just like the children during the war when the mothers were uh, evacuated out of the cities into the countryside and put up with families i think it is absolute it, i for the first time for a long time i'm embarrassed by what this government is doing it does seem a, a something of an extraordinary thing to say for Pretty Patel that we can't actually open our, uh, our gates for them when, as you describe, they are women and children. The men are actually forbidden from leaving Ukraine. Yep, yep. It, it is a disgrace. And they will, they want to do it. It's not a... You can see on these people's faces, my admiration for the Ukrainians is is immense because they're doing what any real settled uh, civilized society would do they protect their women and children and the men do them fighting off what is an absolute bloody lunatic the only other people i think i've got sympathy for are the young russian soldiers because i don't think they want to be there no i think you're probably right yeah okay thanks david harlston sunil (laughs) hi uh Thanks for having me on the radio. Um, I've been listening and, uh, you know, I've noticed for the last couple of days, <laughs> um, a lot of people obviously bashing Putin. Of course, they rightly should. But what I'm, what I'm more curious about is, is Putin's ploy behind all this. I've seen Putin. I've been following, you know, what he's been doing in Syria and Crimea for the last, Crimea for the last 10, 12 years. Somebody who's been very clever and subtle about his uh, propaganda distribution you know, the um, independent media outlets that we've seen, like prop up, um, peddling, uh, kind of distrust of the, of the, of the Western world, sowing distrust between, uh, you know, we've seen what happened with uh, Donald Trump, the elections, Brexit, and he's had a huge part to play with the propaganda he's helped propped up and seen what he's done uh, subtly in Syria without anybody noticing and his incursion into Crimea as well. I just found somebody, some, somebody so cunning as him who's been in power for over 20 years in Russia, why would he make such an obviously stupid mistake where he knows that he's going to get shunned by the international community? He knows that he's going to be opposed by a united Western Europe. And we've seen on mainstream, everybody hates him, everybody's seen what he's doing, and everybody's against him. He's become a pariah. I just... I Can't wonder if, it, well, I, yeah. it, it is difficult to understand from our position now, after we have seen what the West has done, I bet that he didn't expect that, because, as you say, he's been very successful mm-hmm. in sort of fermenting uh-huh. discord within the West, within individual countries. In this country, we've been, the, the Brexiters and the, uh, the Remainers have been fighting each other uh, f- uh, toe-to-toe for about six years now. Uh, and if he's had a hand in that, which by many accounts he has, then uh, it's gone extremely well for him. You know, we seem to be incredibly has. divided. It and and, it just, and, it and it's, the, it's the united response, I bet, that has surprised him. But I think he knew that that was going to happen. We, we all know that Ukraine is, is, a major, is a major part of your... I mean, it's, it's on the, the doorway. I mean, he needs Ukraine to get access to Europe. And also because Ukraine sits on a lot of natural resources. It's very important for us as well here in Western Europe. He must have known that, of course, America, Britain, and most of Europe were not going to be okay with it. I don't believe that somebody who's so savvy when it comes to the media, as he, I mean, he's completely divided the Western left. 
No, you know, no I, I, I don't buy it because when yeah. when has the West ever uh, compiled a series of sanctions like like we have under under what circumstances in the past? They, they, it they never has, so they, he can't possibly have expected they, it. They, they've known they've known that Putin has has been up to something. There's always been a distrust of Putin for sure. There always has been. But it, the problem has been because the Western left has been so divided. There's a lot of people like within the Western left that have actually tacitly supported him by saying, like, listen, don't pick on Putin. Yeah. You guys are just as bad as he is. So now yeah, what's there's, happened there's, there's is that the Western, Western, yeah, Western left has no excuse. They, now they, they've got to con condemn what he's doing because what he's doing is so blatantly wrong. It's in your I face. I bet that that's exactly there's what no he was expecting. He was expecting us to condemn him. I bet he was not expecting us to turn off his money to uh, shut the Russian banks out of the financial system, to uh, for uh, our oil giants to divest themselves of their shares in his uh, oil companies, to um, make it impossible for the oligarchs to actually live the life that they become used to in the West. I bet he wasn't expecting any of that. I bet he was expecting a, a communique from uh, the European Union that uh, they're very cross and uh, and please, uh, it would be nice if he wouldn't mind not doing it again. I bet that's what he was expecting. He can't possibly have been expecting this because it's never happened before. He would have been expecting the mildest rebuke uh, because that's what he's had before. Birmingham. Hello, James. Hello there. Hi, Tom. How are you? Uh, Tom's not here, unfortunately. I'm um, Nick. Sorry. Nick Abbott. Oh, sorry. Beg your pardon. So it's come up on my. Um, I was listening to you on the sky, uh, and it came right. up on the visit. Yeah. How are you, anyway? Good, thanks. Okay. Um, just want to say, first of all, uh, just reminds me of a funny story about uh, Mr. Donald Trump when he met with Kim Jong Un um, when they had their first meeting, and apparently um, Kim Jong Un wanted to. He was in a, in a, in a, in a uh, rush to get back to uh, North Korea, and apparently uh, Mr. Trump offered him a lift on Air Force One. And I was thinking it would be funny if it landed back in, in Korea because he wouldn't have, if the Air Force One wouldn't have taken off for a few years again. I can tell you that now. He probably would have kept him there. Right, my point basically is about the situation in Ukraine. Um, first of all, I want to say, um, uh, you know, what was the purpose of NATO and why was it set up? NATO, the North American Treaty Organization, as I like to call it, was set up to counteract the Warsaw Pact, which no longer exists. Okay, so what happened was, after after the, uh, the Soviet Union collapsed, we, 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 we as a country or Europe should have put our arm around Russia and said, you know, you're with us now. But we were not allowed to do that by guess who? By America. OK, and they've been in a thorn in, 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 in Europe's side since 1945. They were Johnny come late anyway to the Second World War because Russia sacrificed 26 million people. And they were that's the main reason that we're not, we're, you know, we're not all uh, eating sauerkraut three times a day. Sorry to be so blunt, but that's how I feel about it. Right, so, okay, so this is two in a row now, that it's America's fault, not Vladimir Putin's fault. I think he's been saying for a while, you know, that he was, like I said, when the, uh, I think, uh, obviously, you know, when uh, Gorbachev was in power, uh, that NATO had said, we're not going to expand one inch forward uh, to the to the east, and they have been continuously reneged on that. So I'm I'm actually, you know, I, I personally can't blame Mr. Putin for getting, you know, upset like this when now it takes something like this for everybody to listen. But I think he's got a real point in, in thinking that, well, you know, Ukraine should not be a member of NATO and it should never be allowed to have nuclear weapons. I think he's, he's totally right in saying that on his doorstep. Did you, okay, do, do you agree with, did you vote for Brexit? Oh, I did, yes. I, I voted for Brexit, so yes. So is, is it your opinion that a sovereign country should decide of its own accord which international organisation it should belong to? Right, well, Mr. Ah, ah, that's, that, that's a bit of a grey area. Is it? Do we, who, but, Seems yeah, quite clear-cut to me. Well, well, no, I, I don't think Ukraine, uh, as a sovereign country, really, you know, is, uh, uh, is uh, I think, it's, obviously, it's, you know, it's debatable. Uh, yeah, not really. I mean, they voted overwhelmingly in 1991 to declare independence from the Communist Empire. They've been uh, a country, uh, of a sovereign country, for at least that period of time. Uh, okay, well, well may, maybe not in Mr. Putin's eye, but what I'm saying is, right, to avoid... But what's uh, it got to do with him? What, what does another country's uh, fate have to do with a leader from a different country. Uh, well, a, a lot when you think about if his next door neighbour is going to have uh, nuclear weapons, you know, so that's going to that, that's really it, his main it concern. Doesn't, it doesn't have nuclear weapons. That that was part well, of the. Well, if it's going to get invent, well, if if yeah, but eventually if it gets into NATO, it will. That, 
Belgium is in NATO. It doesn't have nuclear weapons. Mm. Well, you know, um, I think, like I said, you know, well, we need to have cool heads here. Then let me say this to you. Nick. Right. Uh, okay, but, you but, know, but so we can only have cool heads on one side. We should just allow Putin to do whatever he wants. Oh, this is kind of depressing, uh, James. I mean, I could go round and around with you, but I don't think I'm going to get anywhere. So, um, thanks for the call, Belfast. Hello, Mark. Mark. Nick, how are you doing? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Go ahead. Uh, Nick, I, you know, it's absolutely breaking my heart to listen to how many people in the West are prepared to fight to the last drop of Ukrainian blood. It's just, I'm sitting here listening how nasty. The West are not getting involved in this fight. We're all sitting in our nice warm homes telling the Ukrainians to fight and fight. This war hasn't even begun. And I, I just think that we need to... We don't have tanks sitting outside our homes or aircraft flying over our homes. And just have a wee bit of thought. It's the Ukrainian, the innocent Ukrainian people who are going to pay for this. And, you know, we're sitting here egging them on, pushing them on. The Russian army... Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. The Russian army, from what I from what I can tell after listen, it hasn't this war hasn't even begun, unfortunately. What I what I see is gonna happen just quickly is within a week or two, Kiev and it is Kiev. It's not Kiev. It's Kiev. Once it's around Kiev, they will give the President Zelensky the chance to get out. And I pray for the sake of the U Ukrainian people that he leaves. And I understand that a lot of people will say, in the West will say, no, he should stay and he should martyr himself. He should make the, the war worse. Get into a helicopter, get across the border, get this war over, save as many of your people as you can. I know there's people sitting in the West with their popcorn ready to push you on and fight to the last drop of your sons and daughters' blood. Please, President Zelensky, get in a helicopter and get out. End this war. End it now. The Russians are probing. They are not fighting. When they probe and they find out exactly where the Ukrainians are, they will move in and they will be ruthless. They will murder and they will murder. The West will sit back, do nothing, but encourage the Ukrainians to fight a first world army please have a bit of respect have a bit of thought for the ukrainian people you don't have a, a tank burning down on your home and these people sitting in the west i can't believe and david lammy earlier on says we will win we will beat putin david lammy is not fighting in the war as far as i know is he he's not signed up to fight in this war He's in his warm house in London, shouting and encouraging people to lose their lives. But you seem As to be you, you seem to be saying that that the Ukrainians should just give up and not fight. What, I, what, what I'm saying, if it had been different, if the West had have taken its, the, the opportunity to help them, then I would say they would stand a chance. They do not stand a chance. Please do not listen to the West. Do not listen to these people who come on night after night and encourage you. Well, the Ukrainians, the, the Ukrainians aren't protecting their own homeland because the West is urging them on. They're doing it because they feel so strongly that uh, nothing else is uh, a possibility for them. And what did you yes, mean? Please. What did you mean when you said it's Kiev, not Kiev? You see, the thing about it is the West and West. We have always called it Kiev. Three or four weeks ago. The, that, the right to, be, to be clear, that's the Russian pronunciation, right? The, but we have always called it that. Well, we don't call we have, it Korea. Yeah. We don't. We don't call it Moscow. We have called always called it Kiev. That's not political. That's what the West calls it. No, but it is. It weeks, is political now because the Ukrainians it because, pronounce it Kiev, right? No, 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 no. Because Fox News a few weeks ago gave out a statement saying that they're going to take political sides, and it's not Kiev. That it's Kiev. The Daily Mail, Fox and News, an editor, Fox News, Fox News, Fox News, the right-wing Trump-led Fox News, yeah. said that it's called Kiev. 
call it Kiev if you want to support the people in Ukraine. I support the people in Ukraine. I don't want journalists who I'm listening to. When I hear a journalist saying Kiev, I know what side they're on. And I just don't know if I'm getting the, the proper information from them. Because but, from but, the get-go... Wait, wait a minute, back up. So you think that okay. by pronouncing it in the way that Ukrainians do, then you're siding with the Russians. That doesn't make any sense. No, 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 no. That's, that's not what I'm saying. The West is always called the Kiev. Yeah, but the West always. calls it Paris. But don't make it... No, you're, not... you're, 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 you're misunderstanding me, Nick. We don't call it, we don't call it Paris. The presidents call it Paris. Right. We don't, we don't call it Moscow. The Americans call it Moscow. We call it Moscow. The Ukrainians call it Kiev. Yeah. The West, we in the West and the United Kingdom and America call it Kiev. You see now any journalist comes onto your TV screen and calls it Kiev. They're taking their lead from Fox News. No, they're not. They're taking their lead from how the Ukrainians pronounce their own capital city. The, the, the Ukrainians have called the capital city Kiev yes. for the last hundreds of years. Where have we ever called it Kiev? What's that got Where to do we... with it? But, so we've been getting it wrong all this time. I, I, you're, I, you're making absolutely no sense at all. Um, but we're going around in a tight circle there, Mark, and I don't think we're going to get we're going to get anywhere. If th- th- people are calling it Kiev now, in recognition of how the Ukrainians um, pronounce their own capital city's name. If you say Kiev, I mean that just might be a force of habit, but it also might be a political decision to um, imply that it belongs to Russia. Uh, Hemel Empstead, hello, Shahid. Yeah, hi Nick. Um, I find this so frustrating, and I don't just mean the the recent situation. I find, you know, going back to, to when the Soviet Union disbanded, because as soon as the Soviet Union disbanded, Britain and America they basically done the modern day equivalent of um, the Battle of Hastings where, you know, the king on the hill and his men thought that the battle was won and they ran down the hill, lost their advantage. They started cutting down on the military straight away thinking, oh, we've got nothing to worry about. You know, the USSR has disbanded. We can, like, start cutting back on our armed forces. And the, I remember that the army were warning back then, don't do this. If ever we need to go into full front war again, you know, full front of war again, we're not going to be in a position to defend ourselves. And Putin or Russia, his predecessors before him, they've gotten their way all along. In 1994, I remember that time when um, America was really frenzied about who has nukes, who wants to get nukes. They're still like that now. And they were worried about Ukraine. They weren't sure about the ex-Soviet states. You know, and they put Ukraine under a lot of pressure to give up their nukes. When Putin came along, you know, Russia was still very poor. Tony Blair, all he did was see the good in him, just... Putin was saying what he wanted to hear. Blair ate out of his hand. So did George W. Bush. After Putin invaded uh, Georgia in 2008, what did Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama do? They gave them a reset button to push. Oh, let's forget about what you've done up until then. We're going to just forget it's all happened. And he's gotten worse and worse and worse. And what has Biden and his Secretary of State been doing? They know they knew this invasion was coming. Instead of like sending them the defensive or even military drones and aircraft jets that they might need, they just been waiting for the brown stuff to hit the fan. And if it was me, I'd be playing Putin at his own game. When he went into Syria to back up um, Assad regime, he used it on the justification that the legitimate pre- uh, president of Syria, which is a sovereign country, he's invited my forces to come in to back him up to protect him from, you know, IS or whoever. Mm. Why can't we do the same? Why can't we say the legitimate elected president of Ukraine has asked not only for our humanitarian aid, he's also asked for a no-fly zone. At the very least, we are going to give him the humanitarian aid. Look here, Putin, you, you know, um, uh, you've got in your own way for far too long. We're going to come in with humanitarian aid, to be protected by our air forces. If you dare strike against us, we're going to retaliate against you. And all this stuff about we... We can't go face to face, nose to nose, two nuclear powers. But the Cold War, just slightly before my time, I started following politics in 1990, and the Berlin Wall came down in 89. But wasn't it the case that up until 89, basically East Germany was Russia, and on the West, you had France, you had Britain, you had America, all there. I remember reading as a paper boy in the late 80s, Checkpoint Charlie and all that lot, and the Berlin Wall and the troops being face to face and all that kind of stuff. 
surely that was two nuclear neighbours then. I, I know the nukes might not have been in eastern Germany per se, but it was really Russia controlling East Germany up until that point. So I think Biden, you know, he's just been standing there gawping like a fool. And this is one of the main reasons why I didn't want him to become president, because I knew how soft he was on these kind of situations. And the Democrats made a big, massive mistake. They went for the easy, well-known option of Joe Biden, whose heart is not in it anymore. You know, he should have won, you know, four years before, you know, when Obama stood down. But he was always going to be a very anti-war, reluctant president. They should have gone for one of the younger guns, like a Cory Booker and Elizabeth Warren. They would have been, they could have sold that to the public. But instead, I thought, oh, no, Biden's well-known, or he'd appeal to some of the rednecks, you know, the racists, you know, let's just go for the easy option. And now we're all paying the price. Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, sure you're, I'm not sure you're right that Biden is uh, a peacenik. I don't think that that's true at all. And I, and I do note that you, you you have a lot of criticism for politicians from the left, and you conveniently stepped right over the last 11 years of a conservative rule in this country, and uh, Donald Trump, who was who appeared to be Vladimir Putin's best buddy in the whole wide world. Um, I think you forgot the blinkers on a bit, Shahid. Watford. Hello, Barbara. Hi. Uh, I just wrote to sing I'm on your side. La, la, la. I'm fed up with his name. He's getting on my bloody wick. And he's all people are watching is a TV, up to date, up to date, up to date. The kids come home from work, I'll turn it on, see what's happening. They listen to it through their headphones. It's driving everyone mad. And I have to pull them back to work and tell them, no, nothing's going to happen. And I've got a 15-year-old granddaughter. She came home from school the other day. And she said, she's not stupid. She said, do you know what? I've been in a pandemic and now we're in a world war. She said, not even in two years. <laughs> <laughs> honestly, if, I mean, if I could go out there and be asleep and get them on my own, I could do it. I'm with you, Barbara. Thanks for that. Now you've done it, Vlad. You've got Barbara's back up. Selby. Hello, Paul. Oh, hello, mate. Paul. Um, got confused since I've been on waiting for it. Um, that fellow, Ben Wallace, yeah? talking about whooping Russians backsides in the Crimea. Well, I'm not a great history student, mate, but as I remember it, apart from being a pointless war, it was us that got out and fucking smacked, including the Charge of the Light Brigade. Well, the Charge of the Light Brigade, so, yeah. Well, that was a Crimean war. And uh, we lost and it, no one won and it was appalling. Um, but that's by the by. I kind of think um, this kind of anti-Russian kind of thing that's going on at the moment with uh, sort of like locally rather than internationally is just yet another um, smoke screen from our dear leaders you know in what at sense the end of the day, well in the end of the day the reason that the Russians are making these moves apart from the obvious NATO stuff is because they realise that we're weak as hell and we can't do anything about it um uh, which I don't think we can, apart from actually going in there physically and trying to stop them, you know. And um, the whole thing is just getting absolutely ridiculous. Um, as far as I'm concerned, um, the Russians are bad news, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But this thing about making it a priority to be Russian oligarchs, well, I don't even know what an oligarch is, do you? But... Uh, all this so-called money that's flushing around. If we're going to do that, why don't we do 90% of the rest of the world uh, putting their money through our banks as well? Do you know what I'm saying, mate? It's, um, I don't agree with it at all, the whole thing. It's, um, it's people on the worldwide scale stoking up a third world war, and there'll be no winners. Well, yeah, and if there's a third world war, there will be no winners. Yeah, that seems uh, inevitable. Thanks, Paul. Stevie in Glasgow, hello. Heck, how are you doing? Good, thanks. Yeah, I've, I've heard the call to arms. I'm prepared to go. I'm, I'm ready to go, travel over, fight against tyranny, dictatorship. Uh, I've booked a flight. I'm off to Ottawa tomorrow. Ottawa? Yep. When you get through, though, we're, we're going after them. <laughs> OK, good luck with that. Thanks, Stevie. Darby, hello, Bill. Hi, Nick. Uh, so, Nick, I, I wanted to make a couple of points, really, uh, maybe more than a couple of points. But 
the humanity survived uh, mutually assured destruction from um, from the Soviet Union and, and and the Western Alliance. We won the second uh, the Cold War in effect. Now, what what I despair when I read history is that our leaders didn't learn any lessons from the First World War, putting punitive measures on Germany for the rise of Hitler and all the bloodshed and chaos that caused you know, uh, 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 after the punitive measures and, and the rise of nationalism. Now, if you look at Putin and his history, before the famous speech in Munich, he was at the very point very close to joining, and he actually wanted to join, he was keen on joining NATO. NATO didn't actually serve a purpose after the, uh, after the end of the Cold War. Now, what I would like to think is, you know, maybe if we had approached this in a different and a better way, managed it, a bit more uh, sensibly with lessons from the first world war and the second world war maybe we would not be where we are today i have friends in Venezia, very close friends and you know um we have a lot of family connections there um from, from my wife's side and and you know it's, it's it's heartbreaking to speak to them and, and see what they're going through you know it's it's, it's, it's terrible what was happening but uh, but what i would like to think is you know if if if, if the things were reversed you know you you, you the crime is obviously committed now, but do we have a part to play as West, our Western leaders have a part to play in pushing that that country or Russia to commit that crime and, and getting closer and closer to the border? But what in you're Syria, saying... What, what you, in Syria... Well, hang on sorry, a just let me make this one All point, right, but on. one last point. In Syria, the, the Tomahawk missiles that are supposed to be decommissioned, the MK4 launchers are in Poland. And this doesn't justify anything that Russia is doing towards Ukraine. Absolutely nothing whatsoever. It's inhumane. It's, and it's just wrong. It, uh, there's no justification for it. But if you just step back and look at it for a minute, if you've got, you know, Tomahawk launchers that are supposed to be decommissioned as part of the treaties, the, which was actually a failed launch was caught in Syria by the Russians, wouldn't, wouldn't we have alarm bells ringing if the, if, if the tables were turned? Or, or you know, if 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 there was something along the lines of NATO in South America, would, would the Americans think I'll say have have a different say or approach towards it? So, I'm just giving an alternative point. Not, you know, Putin has absolutely got serious issues with everything that he's doing. But I think we should be questioning our leaders: Why are we here today? You know, uh, why do we need to be here today? Haven't we learned any lessons from history? But yeah, but, 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 what you're, but what you're saying is, I mean, you made the connection with the First World War and the, the privations that were visited upon Germany did yeah. um, lead in some in some respects to the Second World War because it, yeah. uh, it fermented the rise of nationalism huh? and uh, and uh, you know grievance. But that's not the case here. The the um, the privations are being visited upon Russia after they have attacked another country, not before. You can't, no, you no, can't, no, give, yeah, it yeah, a, you can't give it as no, a reason. No, no, what I'm saying, what I'm saying is, is, is the rise of Hitler and, and, and people who, who cause serious damage to humanity. You know, scenarios, when you push societies in certain scenarios or, or push countries or cultures towards certain environments, you know, mm -hmm. collectively with other countries, it can help people like Putin or right. other, you know, crazy dictators or whoever yes, that might yeah, be. Yeah, but uh, again, that's not the case here, is it, though, Bill? We we haven't caused Putin to act in the way that he's doing because we have ruined Russia's economy. We're ruining Russia's economy because Putin is acting in the way that he's doing. Yeah, the, the point is NATO, Nick. Um, I mean, what, what I'm trying to... What my, what my point is that what purpose did NATO truly serve after the end of the Cold War? Maybe we should have been more, uh, have a reconciliatory approach, a bit more, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, more integrative approach that, you know, we shouldn't have been gloating or maybe pushing more and more towards the East, if, if, if that makes sense. I don't know if I'm... Uh, if I'm well, yeah, I, I, understand, well, I understand what you're saying. I, yeah, I understand what you're saying. It's our fault because we allowed countries to decide of their own volition, which international organizations they should be a part of. We did not uh, capitulate to Vladimir Putin's every demand, so his actions are now our fault. I think that's what you're saying, isn't it? No, I'm not saying it's a fault. No, I'm not saying this. This is it's all behind. Or it's, a, it's the reason. It's the reason why. I, I suppose what we should have maybe, maybe 
in hindsight, maybe we should our approach should have been if Putin or Russia wanted to join NATO and NATO had to survive, maybe we could have integrated Russia in, or made Europe more, more inclusive, I suppose. I don't know. So but nobody would seem odd, though, because NATO was uh, set up, as far as I'm aware. As, it. Exactly, yeah. yeah as Russia. A, exactly. USSR. Right. Yeah. So. But, but the, Russia, the USSR had finished. The Cold War had finished. And when, when, when Yeltsin went away and all the rest of things happened and when Putin came, there was a long period until that speech in Munich, when the, 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 the security threat, that, uh, uh, the speech that uh, Putin gave in Munich, he was actually very keen to join NATO. But we refused that. So I, I don't know. I mean, you know, I'm not a politician. I'm not really a, you know, a political scientist or anything. But, you know, we could have been more inclusive. Right. Know? Well, um, th that's actually news to me. I'm, I'm not aware of that. Uh, it seems seems unlikely but if you say so bill uh sutton hello dave oh hi nick nick i wonder if you could just tell me the difference between what putin's done and what was done with the blair government in iraq and margaret thatcher with the falklands and the cuban missile crisis the way the americans handled it please why is putin any different when he was giving the west 12 months of warnings and begging them not to put nuke missile bases and missile shields on his doorstep in Ukraine. Explain the difference, please, Nick. Uh, well, there's no doubt about it. Any war that in any country that engages in war has probably uh, had war crimes committed in its name or by its people. We're, we're no different from uh, anybody else in that regard. That's what war is. It's I mean, war is is a crime, and war crimes happen in war inevitably. So uh, there is precious little difference if particularly if you are on the end of being tortured or killed or um, you know the, all, all of the rest of it so i agree with you there but that was then and this is now if, if you go down the rabbit hole of what about then nobody ever does anything about anything because there's always what about i understand that nick but i think even the man in the street nick and i, I deal with a lot of people um I won't tell you what I do, Nick, but I am I deal with normal people. And I think everyone's slowly getting sick. It's, a, it's terrible what's happening over there, Nick. But this constant lambasting of Putin, Nick, he's done nothing different to any other world leader in the interest of national security. How could he let them put these missile nuke bases in Ukraine when it's in his back garden? They, How would the they, Russian people ever feel secure, Nick? Ukraine doesn't have nu uh, missile, nuclear missile bases. NATO wanted to do it. They had threatened Russia over the last two years, and they were going to do it. They were going to put these nu missile shields there no, uh, I across don't, the whole of I, Ukraine. I don't think that's Go right. I don't think that's right. I mean, the whole point of uh, the, this Budapest memorandum, which keeps coming up over and over again, was to rid Ukraine of nuclear weapons. So I don't really understand where you're getting that from. But all, all he asked them to do, Nick, was not to join NATO. If you look at the papers, well, Nick, they, or they, Google, they, they haven't joined NATO. But they were going to, Nick, and they were threatening Russia. How could who, Putin who do was, anything different? Who was threatening Russia? The Ukrainian government was threatening the Russians. Uh, there was but also were, genocide. Wait a minute, wait, hang on, the, hang on, whoa, 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 whoa. On. back up. The Ukrainian government was threatening Russia in what way? They were saying there were going to be problems, they were, going to, they were saying they were going to have attacks, there was genocide in Donetsk uh, areas, etc., etc. It's been pretty hard for the Russians living in Ukraine, Nick. The Western media won't mention that. Uh, probably because almost nothing that you've said so far is true. I, I don't know which website you're reading, Dave, but maybe try another one. Get off the internet for a while. Maybe read a book or a paper or something. Or whatever you're reading at the moment, Dave, is not doing you any good. But I uh, appreciate that. Thanks. Blackpool. Hello, Jason. Oh, hello. Hello. Jason. Um, first time I've ever heard up on one of these shows. Oh, so. welcome along. Thank you. Um... First point I'd probably make is that uh, this is this is all part of Biden's weakness. From from my perspective, um, I think that uh, we've got we've, we've got bigger dangers than, than what we just actually are thinking of at the, at the at the first point. I think after Afghanistan, you've got the Ukraine, uh, but Biden is also um, uh, without being funny, there's. There's, there's two causes to war. One is land, one's, one is religion, the traditional causes. 
Biden's currently negotiating with with Iran for nuclear weapons. So he, he, he's already making a mistake you know, by showing his weakness of Afghanistan. He's, he's, he's allowed it to happen with Ukraine, and, and he's about to, you know, even if we can resolve this one, um, with, you know, he's going to allow um, you know, a, a religious organ, you know, a, a, a religious country. Yeah, who has absolute hatred of other countries in the Middle East to actually have nuclear weapons. Well, that's not so what it, that's not what he's um, negotiating at all. Iran, well, he's he's negotiating with Iran that they can have nuclear weapons. That's that's not the point of the negotiation at all. Well, well, that's the, well, that's what he's actually doing in Vienna at the moment because it's the if you you look at. Uh, uh, countries like um, Israel and those sort of things are absolutely petrified in the Middle East of him. Um, and, and the fact that uh, um, after uh, the uh, Obama negotiation, it, it's, uh, uh, Trump took it back and uh, it, 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 he's, uh, it, he's allowing them to actually uh, get nuclear weapons again. Well, you it's, know? It's, um, not, it's not about nuclear weapons, it's about nuclear power. Well, I think that's probably semantics. Um, in this particular case, uh, the, the, to me, the, the actual bigger issue is that the weakness of, of Biden has actually uh, uh, is, is, is allowing people like Putin, is allowing people like uh, you know the uh, Iran uh, regime to actually carry on with their um, nuclear scenario. So I, I think that even if we actually resolve, and I think we do resolve. Ukrainian issue, and, and Putin is actually threatening, um, you know, or, or mm. implying uh, yeah. nuclear weapons. We, 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 you know, in the next couple of years, we're going to have another round, but this time with Iran. But you do un- think- you do understand that with the Iranian thing, the the deal mm. that we had with Iran was for them to give up their nuclear uh, program. But they, but they, they, they were and doing it, was, it behind it, the. They, it they, was they, only they after the it was only after Donald Trump th- tore up that agreement that Iran restarted its nuclear program. It was Trump. Would you honestly believe that? Of, well, it's true. No, since when? Because the they've, because they've, they've, you know uh, a few years ago, um, the the chief um, person of the um, Iranians, um, nuclear, I forget his name, was was was, was actually killed. Um, the, 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 do you actually believe, do you honestly believe they actually gave up? Um, building their uh, nuclear weapons. Well, part, and, and, of, part, or, or of the, part of the deal was that it was verified independently. So, it's in your opinion, then, this is Joe Biden's fault, and if, uh, uh, by extension, we had uh, Donald Trump in power, none of this would have happened. I think, well, if we look at what happened with North Korea, I mean, to put it bluntly, I, I'm no great fan of Trump. I think some of the things he did were absolutely disgusting, and some of the things he said was even worse. Right. But if you but if you look at um, you know, and the, the thing that came to mind was the actual children on the borders of his own of his own country that were in camps. Right. That was, that, that, yeah. was, that, that was outrageous. Right. But you know, the but when you look at um, North Korea and they and the, and the, and they were threatening. He actually he showed strength to actually say, "Well, yeah, he you've showed, got a rocket." He showed, I, I, he showed strength by to, by to, by, to, go, by going to North Korea to um, to have an audience with Kim Jong Un. That was strength he, to you, was it? It didn't look like strength to me. It looked like um, Trump um, buddying up to yet another dictator. He seems to absolutely love autocrats, probably because he uh, fancied himself in that role. I, I think you need to stop reading the internet, Jason. It's not doing you any good. Hammersmith. Hello, Grish. Hi, this is Grish. How are you doing, Nick? You OK? Yes, good, thanks. Uh, the reality is politicians. I, I don't know what to, to, to say about them. In this country, they're just dominating the discourse, okay? Like this whole big G government business. Uh, what I want to speak about was actually the regional politics of Eastern Europe. And uh, well, I think, historically speaking, I think there's support for the Russian national interest. I mean, it's a question of self-defense. It's a question of self-defense on the Russian border. And a lack of knowledge of... There's possibly a lack of knowledge of kind of Eurasian culture. When you say that there's support, fr- from whom? 
I think the, the neighboring countries, I think in, the, in Eastern Europe on the whole, I don't, see they, I don't think the, the people of uh, Eastern Europe see Russia as being a threat in any way. I, I think on the whole they see Russia as just being on the whole just a kind of uh, saying back and kind of protecting their own national interest in a sense. Well, which, which they, countries, see, uh, well, hang on, which countries are you talking about? Well, I'm just talking about, well, you know, uh, like the bordering countries, I can't really go into... Estonia, I mean, Latvia... Well, like, for example, I saw something in the news like... Uh, even like a country like Poland, you know, and they're, they're quite sympathetic for the culture. It's a cultural question for me. I think uh, the problem with, for me, as I mentioned at the very beginning, is this, these politicians, the reality is politicians who claim this kind of omniscience or this kind of panoramic vision of everything. Um, they did, I, I just don't, like, I don't really trust them, to be honest. So, I mean, is it your opinion then that the people of Ukraine are actually uh, supportive of Russia's attempt to, in the, uh, the way that Russia puts it, um, come in to uh, protect them. Yeah, well, th that's a fact. I mean, remember what happened several years ago uh, with uh, Eastern, Eastern Ukraine and uh, Donetsk and that there was this, the support there for uh, uh, the people, you know, the support from the people there. But, you know, at the end of the day, I, I keep coming back to these so-called politicians who put out this propaganda. Uh, Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein uh, is a, a, a great Austrian philosopher. He once said, whereof one, one cannot speak, thereof one must remain silent. And I wonder whether these politicians should not now and again remain silent instead of claiming all, to have all this knowledge about everything. Well, if nobody without great knowledge uh, was allowed to speak about any subject, then um, <laughs> we would be listening to nothing but silence, Grish. Uh, it's an interesting idea that the people of uh, Eastern Europe uh, fear Russia not a lot or at all, I think is the point that you're making. I'm not sure that is actually borne out by facts, but it's an opinion. Thanks for that, Grish. Walsall. Hello, Mick. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mick. Oh, you took me by surprise. Then. There we go. Oh, there you are, Mick. Yeah, I'm there. Uh, and what I was going to say is that uh, I've seen the MPs all clapping and for Ukraine. I've seen them all on the um, European Union clapping him when he's on the telly. Mm -hmm. And uh, all the sanctions and whatever. And I can only surmise that uh, President Putin is shaking in his shoes. <laughs> right. I, I, I know a, a hint of sarcasm being, there, Mick. I'm being sarcastic. Yeah. Because, let's face it, we, we're watching genocide happen live and doing absolutely nothing. Well, that's not entirely true. Yeah, because we're not doing nothing. Well, we're sending them arms. We're sending them arms, we, and we've we, put together a, a, a package of sanctions that does damage us quite significantly we're not going to get away with uh, being untouched by what we're doing and um his putin's actions have done what is, is actually a remarkable thing it's brought all of the country pretty much all of the countries in the world uh, at least the ones that you'd want to take a holiday in together on this issue like no, like none before yeah but if he actually takes ukraine the whole of ukraine that's worth a hell of a lot more than anything you might have lost in sanctions. Um, well, so, I'm not entirely sure about that, but the, the point about taking Ukraine is, it might be easy to, well, he's finding it not as easy as he, expe as he expected, but it's relatively easy to sweep through a country and take over. It's what comes next. That's the hard part, is keeping control of it. And I don't think that he's either got the, the money or the resources or the manpower and, um, or, and, the, the, and that his forces have the wherewithal or desire to do such a thing. Well, it's that, that, that point on the, the desire, because, I mean, Ukraine and Russia were pretty well aligned. And there's a lot of mixed marriages Ukraine, Ukraine is married Russians. Right. That amounts so, to a mixed marriage, does it? Okay. All right. Thanks a lot, Mick. Belfast. Hello, Brendan. Oh, hello. Uh, thanks for taking my call. Um, I would like to say, first and foremost, before I be um, referred to as a Russian troll or anything of that nature, I am not a Putin fan in this uh, conflict. I believe firmly that he's a liar. I believe firmly that uh, there are problems on both sides. But what I would say is that 
the rank hypocrisy of the Western media in relation to this, uh, whatever you, conflict, incursion, invasion, whatever you choose to call it, depending on what side you've chosen, it's unbelievable. Uh, you, know, you actually hear people sneering at Putin for uh, having difficulty in moving forward within the Ukrainian territory. And maybe that's because uh, they're used to the British government, the French government, the Germans and uh, the Americans. Carpet bombing areas from the safety of their sky and from hundreds of miles away to carve up and to uh, blow apart the soft underbelly before the dirt put a tank or a foot on the ground. So what I'm saying is, and this is your show now, and you, uh, to my surprise and shock, are a part of this now. You've had numerous British army officers who now describe themselves as experts, and they are, because they have fought more wars. My Boris Johnson was on his feet crying crocodile tears for the people of Ukraine in the House of Commons the other day. RAF bombers were bombing Syria, Somalia, and other countries. Exactly at the moment he was on his feet. Where is the balance? Where is the... Where are we going to hear actual news and journalism so that we can make our own minds up? Propaganda is not the answer. It's sickening. Well, what, no, what you, thing, what, it's not propaganda. What, what you're saying is that there is a lack of coverage of other uh, of other wars and skirmishes and uh, other aggression, and that may be yeah. true, but that but that's just a what about? I mean, can we deal with one thing? and decide the rights and wrongs of it without getting into an endless what about this and what about that because that doesn't really get you anywhere. I mean, you can go... W- once you start doing the what abouts, then you just start going back into history and uh, pretty soon we'll be, um, uh, we'll be uh, talking about the, the, the invasion of the Visigoths. Did the Vi- Visigoths invade? I can't recall. Um, I'll, I'll look it up on the History Channel. Thanks a lot, Brendan. Edinburgh. Hello, Al. Hi, Nick. Uh, a sort of a question, really. Uh, we had Johnson standing at this lectern in Poland today, you know, when he was challenged by this Ukrainian journalist. Mm. I suppose my thought are, uh, thoughts are, if President Zelensky was the UK Prime Minister standing at that lectern, what would he have said to the journalist? And I think the answer he would give would be, these planes are taking off right now to set up that no no fly zone. Well, it's. I mean, we're all very impressed with the Ukrainian president, but it's a it, it's a completely different situation to defend your own country from an invader, and to be an outside country um, offering your troops uh, to what might be. Um, Again, this is the phrase everybody keeps coming up with: the start of World War Three. So I, I get what you, I get what you're saying. He's a, the uh, Ukrainian president is a more impressive figure than our own, but um, it, they are in uh, different circumstances. Uh, perhaps a better question would be: What might Boris Johnson do if he were the Ukrainian president? And um, I guess he would look for the nearest walk-in fridge. Stockport, hello, Jackie. Nick, um, yeah, I think you've just said what I want to say. Um, yes, it is a kind of um, knee-jerk reaction, reaction if, if you like. Of course we want to help. I mean, who doesn't want to help? But for a member, a member of the government to say, oh, yeah, yeah, it's fine, no caveats, no warnings, no, you know, kind of think about this. Have you ever been in a war zone before? Have you ever seen a dead body before? Totally irresponsible as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, almost uh, as though she's um, not in the right position, not in the right job. Well, I've actually said this. I had a bit of a rant my hubby, who's a conservative. <laughs> Bless his heart, he tried to defend her. He actually gave in in the end. Right. <laughs> and says, yeah, 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 okay. You know. Is that the way that many arguments go in your house? Uh, that I win, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, of course. 
Come well, on. I'm glad to hear I'm, it, Jackie. I'm that... Labour. He's Conservative. Of course they do. Right. OK. <laughs> Good for you. Thanks for that. Barnes. Hello, James. Hi, Nick. Nick, um, I spoke to you a while ago, actually, about this, and we, we were uh, adjusting about the, uh, the Putin... Um, you know, everybody was an apologist for Putin, and he, you know, we can't let him tell other countries whether they can join Ukraine or not. Now, that's fair enough. The, the uh, US, the the, NATO, it, you mean, not join Ukraine. NATO. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I beg your pardon, yeah. That's on the face of it, that, that's fine. But as you said earlier, we're dealing with a child, and sometimes with children, you have to make them think they're getting what they want. And it's all very well for the West. To, and Liz Trust and everybody and you and we can't allow him to tell us who can join NATO. Who is does he think he is? But it's all very well having that stance, Nick. But then we are in a situation now where we can end up with Ukraine looking like Syria because of our stance on NATO. And I think that although Putin is an, a, a madman and insane, as we know, and has got this insane thing that Soviet Union has to be, you know, put back together again somehow. I think that we have made a huge, huge error because it's all very well having, you know, we're not going to be bullied. We're not going to let bullies tell us what to do. But we have allowed bullies to tell us what to do. It's all very well having a stance. But if you just stand back when they then, <laughs> when they then call your bluff, you look a bit stupid. And now we are toothless, and it's shocking. It's, it is the most terrifying thing. And I think that the Western democracies of the world have got only themselves to blame. As of, I'm not making an apologist for Putin, but we should have done what Lord Dannett said, who was the ex-armed forces, head of the armed forces. Ukraine has no necessity, it's not necessary for Ukraine to join NATO, and we should have assured him that they will not join NATO. Because we are now in a situation where we can be, yes, we're not going to be bullied, but we are being bullied. And that is the irony and the contradiction of the stance of everybody that has taken this stance. But, that's we, suppo but your position supposes that, that that is what would have placated Vladimir Putin if we just assure him that Ukraine yes, was not going... Yes, yeah. well, I think I can't believe that for a second. So you think that he actually, he's not, he would have, if we would have said to him, listen, uh, Vladimir, uh, don't, we're going to sign a, a thing with you hmm. that we'll, we're also going to make sure that Ukraine takes out of their constitution that yeah. they're going to join NATO, and we guarantee they will never be allowed to mm -hmm. join NATO. You think he would have said, fine, thank you very much, and then in a year's time, done the same, done this again. James you, th you, so. James, you think that, because you started this conversation by saying that what Vladimir Putin wanted to do was to reform the USSR. I think, he, I think that that is, he's got an excuse to do it. And his excuse is we're not giving, I mean, you know, he's coming up with all the, the nonsense of, re, you know, getting Nazis out of Ukraine and, you know, all this nonsense and lies. And, but we have given him the reason to do it. if we would have not given him a reason you know the chances are we could have seen him off eventually but i think that by we what had... method we would have been in the same position as you said he wants to reform the ussr so he is using it as an excuse regardless of I what think... we've done he is using it, but we've given him the excuse nick he wouldn't I... need an excuse he was going to do it anyway by your own no, account I don't. I don't think he would have done it anyway. I think that that's what he. I, that's his ideology. Right. That's so, what he really so okay. So essentially, it's all our fault. I just don't buy it. I. So, I understand what you're saying, and it's an argument I've heard uh, already, James. But I do not believe for a moment that if we had assured uh, Vladimir Putin and uh, put a bow and sprinkles on it to make absolutely uh, sure that uh, we meant it, that Ukraine was not going to. Uh, join NATO that have made the slightest bit of difference. In fact, I don't believe that that's actually what's going on here. I think it's all about him cementing in his position of power. What does a dictator who is unpopular at home do? What's their go-to action in order to beef up their support at home? Have a war. Works every time. 
people uh, rally to the flag, the popularity goes through the roof, and he can uh, spend uh, another decade or more comfortably in charge. All of this other stuff about uh, joint, I mean, NATO is not an aggressive organization. NATO was never going to invade Russia, he knows that. He's a, like I said, he's a megalomaniac, he's not insane. Well, let's hope he's not insane. Pinner, Anil. Hello. Yes, sir. Hello, Mr. Abbott. I, I think it's all words, 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 as Shakespeare said. And it was always words, words, words. If Putin is antichrist, then the attitudes of the people who run the establishment in the United Kingdom and the United States was a, the establishments were aware that Ukraine, Ukraine was never going to be part of NATO. It never ever was going to be. Russia requires a warm water port. Warm water port. You have to recognize the essential difficulty in which Putin finds himself. He has no warm water outlets in the Mediterranean. Everything but everything. The northern end of Russia, the Mediterranean end of Russia is heavily guarded against and he is totally out of action. And I cannot see Russia who has to defend the interest, um, Putin, who has to defend the interests of Russia, because he's not that much of a riddle. For 20 years, he's been trying to say, look, I deal with me. They refuse to deal with him. And now they come to an impasse, people have died, and they're still telling him, look, we'll do something for you, such as what? Do sanctions, personalized sanctions, how do they really count? Does Putin going to come out of Russia? And all right, you've got the foreign minister, you prevent him coming and you'll send in a second. What does it really matter? I mean, please, for God's sake, you've got to bring Russia into the fold. What does that mean, Look at in, a, into the fold? What I am trying to say is that Russia is European, but it is also Asian. And bring it in, just as you have to bring China in. But what does, it, what does, China, but what does bringing it in mean? What it means is, please talk to the guy, please bring him in. You want to impose sanctions on him, you want to prevent him getting money. You really want to supply oil. The Americans really want to supply oil to Europe. They want Germany to change their oil supplier. You think that this that is, is about important. you think that this is about America wanting to sell Germany its oil? That's it. I think it is very much that because they basically want to deprive Russia. So how, financial right, so how has America made Russia invade Ukraine? No, it hasn't made Russia invade Ukraine, but Putin has been under threat for 20 years and he has come to the conclusion that the opposite side is never going to talk, talk, talk sensibly. But, but, what, but, so, but talk, talk, talk sensibly, I, I think what you're saying is that we should just allow him to take over a sovereign country um, okay, at, could, I then, could, I then in, could I then interrupt what you're saying? In, in order to get his Can hands I? on a warm water port. Very important to him. Well, yeah, no doubt. But Very, I mean, I but mean, if we if we thought, oh, you know what, Calais looks nice, uh, can we just take that too? No, it's not as simple as that. So it isn't as simple as that. He is the head of a country, which is the largest country in the world. He has to protect that country and its operations. But protect it from he what, though? protected from being surrounded in the history how many times since 1605 over 500 years every 30 years russia has fought a war with people coming in from the euros poland began it napoleon hitler crimea i mean let's 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 put a stop to it for god's sake even marx marx is not dead you may not like his philosophy, and and it isn't being practiced, but but incorporate them into the system, incorporate Latin. I'm sorry, I'm going outside my topic. I won't yeah, um, take your time. But it's. But I don't see how we haven't incorporated Russia into the system. I mean, that all countries in the world, 
particularly the large ones, are financially woven together, as, as we're about to uh, find out to our, um, our cost. Because sanctions against Russia are going to hurt us too. Uh, I, 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 we, we haven't uh, denied them access to the modern world, and neither have we surrounded them. If a country wants to join NATO, then it should be allowed to do it. You know, I've heard this argument so many times from people who have who voted Brexit because they wanted to uh, decide which international organization they were a part of. And that was our right, apparently, but it apparently is not the right of Ukraine whose uh, existence people uh, question. They, is it even a real country, they say? What does it matter what the people of Ukraine do or do not want? Uh, let's um, dis let's uh, decide their future on the basis of what a dictator from another country wants. Uh, I, can't, um, I can't see the sense in that. But thanks, Anil. Morzine in France. Hello, Martin. M Martin. Oh, hello there. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Um, Are you all right? Yes, I'm very well, thank you. There's a lot of people out there that keep going on about World War One, World War Two, and everything going on. But there's modern technology that can happen now. I actually don't believe the Russian people believe in this thing, and I also believe that they are undergoing a lot of propaganda of what's going on. And I think the West could actually put an anti-propaganda thing by sending messages to the Russian people themselves to say, look, this is what's really happening. Look, the people aren't, these people aren't running to Russia. They're running to the West. These refugees and these people running from a war zone aren't running towards Russia. They're running towards Poland and other countries in the West. It would be if. extraordinary if we weren't doing that already. I mean, you'd have to assume that we are doing that uh, and the whole of the West is doing it, hell for leather. Well, absolutely right. But how can we not let the Russian people know that Mr. Putin is doing something completely wrong here? Well, well uh, as I say, I'm, I'm sure that we are engaged in doing that. I mean, it, it being um, part of the secret service, they wouldn't broadcast that fact to us, but let's hope they are broadcasting it to Russia uh, through um, uh, the uh, internet and the uh, world service and uh, any other means at their disposal. I mean, if they haven't thought of that, then <laughs> what the hell are we spending the, our money on the secret uh, services for? Thanks, Martin. Uh, barking. Hello, Yanks. Hello, Nick. How are you? Good, thanks. Yes. So, Nick, here is my point. My point is this. Uh, Vladimir Putin is not going to start a nuclear war and is not going to start World War Three. All that he is doing is bluffing. But one thing, Putin is doing what he is doing because he believes that he has nuclear weapons. And no one is going to challenge him because of those nuclear weapons. The reason why he believes in nuclear weapons is because he fears them more than anything else. So the best way what NATO can do for an EU can do for Ukraine now is to threaten or to warn Putin that if he doesn't stop what he's doing, they're going to provide Ukraine with nuclear warheads. Because one thing we, sh we, we should know is this. If Ukraine had a u nuclear warhead, Putin wouldn't have attacked in, uh, Ukraine. But the only reason he went after them is because he knew very well that they did not have those kind of weapons. And number two, he knew that they're not part of any organization that has such weapons. Putin fears nuclear weapons than anyone else. That's why he believes in it more as a deterrent and he believes in it as anything else. So if he knows that or oh, he is made aware that NATO is going to provide Ukraine with nuclear weapons, Putin is going to back off. And that's the best way NATO can do now to deter Putin from further aggression on Ukraine. Right. I don't so believe, so the, I don't believe the answer to the nuclear weapons threat is more nuclear weapons. Not sure about that. It's not, it's not more nuclear weapons. But look, the reality is this. 
non-proliferation of nuclear weapons treaty is gone and dusted now. After this, now, every other country is going to arm themselves with nuclear weapons because the five members of the Security Council we thought are responsible members. They are going to help people, but they're not going to use the nuclear weapon to bully other nations. And Russia has proven every, everybody wrong on that. So now the reality that we have to deal with or appreciate is that the world cannot carry on as it was before. Everything has changed from now on. What we need to do is Ukraine needs to have a deterrent to um, um, compel Vladimir Putin to stop the aggression. Right. And the only way that can happen now is, is not no, no fly right. zone. It, they have to be provided with it. Yeah, so, and, but... but <laughs> If I, the, I, the, it doesn't make any sense to me because they're not going to use it. If you give the Ukraine a hundred nuclear weapons, they're not going to use them. And um, so, what's the point? But um, I appreciate the call. Uh, thanks, uh, Yanks. Maybe I'm just getting. Maybe I'm all uh, strung out and a bit <laughs> stressed. I'm just sort of at the end of my tether with this, with this uh, end of the world stuff. Uh, Paul says, Nick, you just said you hope Putin is not insane, and that's the problem. If he is insane, and if he pushed, if he's pushed into a corner, feels he has no escape, and will end up on trial for war crimes, he might just think that he may as well take the worst possible way out. Yeah, but he's not, he's, he's not an island. He does have family. He does, he's just built a place, I think it's in Sochi, where they had the Winter Olympics. It's a palace, which I believe is last time i looked it was something like eight times the size of buckingham palace i mean this is a man who loves his luxuries can you really imagine that he wants to spend the rest of his life in a bunker greenwich hello andrew hello how are you nick andrew uh, first time caller good man thank you for let me know on the let me go online so i want to tell you my experience because i am uh, polish i was born in poland my mother is ukrainian and then my father is Lithuania, Polish from Lithuania. When they spread the borders at the Second World War, they moved them to German's land, belongs to Prussia before. So, to tell you the truth, Polish people, they treat very badly Ukrainians after the Second World War because they fight together arm to arm with the Germans. Right. And and wait, wait, the, the the history, Ukra wait, hang on a minute. The, the Ukrainians fought with the Germans? Okay. Yes. If you check the history of the Warsaw, when the Germans start to fight uh, and same thing like it's now in Kiev, take Warsaw over, the Germans fight together with the Ukrainians against Poland. Right, I, I wasn't aware. I'm not. I, uh, history is. Um, I've got a massive blank space in my knowledge, which uh, comes under the heading history. But I thought that the Ukrainians were. Um, sort of in the firing line when the Russians were advancing on, when the Germans rather were advancing on Russia and it's the Ukrainians that suffered the greatest um, number of f fatalities at the hands of the no, Germans. No, I've got yeah, that, I've some got of that them, wrong. Yeah, some, of them, some of them, yes. Some of them, no. They opened their own like uh, occupied part of Poland. They've been uh, killing for each other. Polish people, they're killing Ukrainians, Ukrainians killing Okay. Polish, All right. So that, that's, you, okay. So that's what happened. But what what yeah. point would you like to make about what's happening? And, the, and then when my mom she wants to, when my father she wants to marry my mom, they everybody say never married her because she is Ukrainian. So he took the choice. He married her. And then they never they live as the Polish Ukrainians. They used to live there as a, as a neighbors, but they always hate each other. Right. I always, I never said at school I'm Ukrainian for the fact because the kids have been bullying me at school all the time. Okay, so yeah, neighbors, um, neighboring countries tend to think ill of each other. So, yeah. yeah. But, but what's your point about what's happening? Yeah, and then I used to go to Ukraine many times. If my passport is full with stamps and I used to live in the US for many years, seven years. And then my, even I have many friends from Kaliningrad, like the biggest air forces, all of them the Russians, uh, air pilots, very powerful pick in Europe. Mm. So, uh, this tell you the truth, that, that war, is, war is very difficult for everybody. This is like the neighbor's war. They speak same language and are very similar and like brothers and sisters. Right. Um, okay. I'm. 
uh, I'm finding it a bit difficult to detect a point there, Andrew, but um, I, uh, I appreciate the call. Thanks for that. Edinburgh. Hello, David. Hi, it's me, your know, son. David. Hi, it's David. Hi. I've been homeless for a good many a year, and I don't get any help. But uh, they seem to uh, bother about uh, they want to bring all these refugees coming in from this place or that place. I think they should claim asylum like in Poland or other uh, surrounding uh, countries first. And then, if you can bring some in, that's fair enough, but not uh, loads. This country is bad enough. We don't even uh, help our own people, what's homeless or pensioners. Really? Yeah. Just... Well, I, I understand what you're saying, but I, I don't think it's an either or. I mean, it's pretty bad that we have people sleeping on the streets in this country and that people are, um, like yourself, long term homeless. I mean, it's absolutely shameful. But I don't think it should be either the authorities should help people like yourself, David, or they should help people who are fleeing conflict. I think we have to admit that we are plenty well off enough to do both. I mean, we keep hearing that we're the fifth richest economy in the world. What, what's the point of all that money if uh, we can't actually house our own people in desperate need and uh, extend a, a hand of welcome to those that are in need coming from abroad? Uh, Britain has extended the family criteria for qualifying to get a visa to, end, to uh, enter the UK to allow an additional 100,000 people leaving Ukraine to come here. That's what we're talking about in this hour. Uh, I wish you well, David. Thanks for that.